Welcome to the introductory course on grade and summary of findings tables. This module is part of a series of modules. It deals with assessing indirectness. The module is part of a comprehensive series of training modules, including an introduction to grade and summary of findings tables, how to grade the quality of a body of evidence, including the risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, publication bias, and other factors, choosing comparisons and outcomes, and how to use the Grade Profiler software, GradePro. This module deals with indirectness. Remember, in the grade approach, we assess the quality of a body of evidence. We separate the likelihood of and the confidence in an effect. It is like two meteorologists predicting the weather and one saying to another, I figure there's a 40% chance of showers and a 10% chance we know what we are talking about. The conceptual approach to assessing the quality of evidence in healthcare research is very similar. The estimate of a 40% chance of showers may be very precise. In fact, there may be very narrow confidence intervals around it. However, just imagine that the meteorologists are predicting the weather for New York City and they are applying a model that was developed in Australia. Their confidence in the actual estimate of 40% chance of showers may be very limited, expressed here by a 10% chance we know what we are talking about. The situation is analogous to that in healthcare, where we may have estimates of effect that are supported by low-quality evidence that limit our confidence in any estimate of the effect. The quality of evidence in the grade approach is expressed in four levels, ranging from 4 plus to 1 plus. 4 plus indicates we are very confident that the true effect lies close to that of the estimate of the effect. It's also called high quality evidence. Please remember that we are talking about the quality of the body of evidence that is across the underlying available research. And it goes down to one plus evidence, also called very low quality evidence, that expresses that we have very little confidence in the estimate of effect. And the true effect is likely to be substantially different from the actual estimate of the effect based on the available research. How confident we are in the results are expressed in relation to the original healthcare question that was asked. The healthcare question that was asked is frequently expressed in the PICO format. The PICO format population intervention comparators and outcomes. This approach allows a systematic development of healthcare questions and has other advantages in that it helps us assessing several of quality criteria in grade, such as indirectness, that is the focus of this module. The PICO approach helps us to assess whether the evidence is direct enough that we have high confidence that we can use the evidence to answer the healthcare question at hand. Direct evidence comes from research that is conducted in the populations or systems that we are trying to provide answers for, includes the interventions that we are interested in, and compares these interventions with the appropriate comparators or alternatives and direct evidence comes from research that measures the outcomes in which we are actually interested and that are important to the population at hand. The directness of the evidence includes conceptual issues that are frequently expressed in the terms generalizability, transferability, applicability, and external validity. Directness of the evidence has to do with whether the available research evidence is direct enough to answer the question at hand. For instance, if we are interested in addressing healthcare questions for low- and middle-income countries and all the evidence comes from high-income countries, we need to make judgments about directness. We may be interested in patients who live with HIV and the evidence comes from a general group of patients, such as all patients. We may be interested in comparing new antibiotics in a class, and all the evidence comes from old antibiotics. We may be interested in a comparison against no intervention, such as no antibiotics, 
but all the available evidence comes from a comparison against another class of antibiotics. In addition, we are usually interested in patient or population important outcomes, but the evidence may include information only on surrogate outcomes. We might have to draw inferences and make judgments about whether the outcomes truly relate to patient important outcomes. Finally, we may be interested in a comparison of intervention A versus intervention B, and all that we have is a comparison of intervention A versus A control and intervention B versus a control. We know that these indirect comparisons may not express effects correctly. So when is the evidence indirect for a population? A systematic review may ask, what are the effects of self-management in programs in people with asthma? Consider the following separate scenarios for the outcome quality of life. For instance, what if five out of six studies include people with severe asthma and we are interested in making judgments or providing an answer for patients who have mild asthma? Four out of six studies may be in children that are younger than 15 years old. Do these results directly apply to adults? And third, all of the studies may have been conducted in women. Would the results be directly applicable to men? These judgments will influence the directness of the evidence. Review authors may actually identify groups within the population that may have different baseline risks for the outcome of interest. That is, the control group risk or event rate is different for the different populations. If there are important differences in the baseline risk, review authors can indicate that in the summary of findings table by providing different estimates for different risk populations. The information that the baseline risk truly differs may come from either trials or good observational studies. However, they should choose representative risk populations, such as in this example, the baseline risk may be 10% or 10 per 100 in the low risk population, and it may be 50 per 100 or 50% in the high risk population. Review authors may also identify groups within a population in whom the intervention may work differently. The intervention, in fact, may have a different relative effect in each subgroup. That is, there may be an interaction by subgroup. A separate meta-analysis for the relevant subgroups should be conducted under those circumstances. Consider the example of parental anticoagulants for patients with cancer. The outcome is mortality at 12 months. The authors suspected a difference in patients based on the cancer type. They looked at two different patient groups, patients with small cell lung cancer and patients with advanced cancer in general. This meta-analysis shows the results for cancers other than small cell lung carcinoma for patients with small cell lung carcinoma and the oval effect. The effect in patients with cancers other than Small cell lung cancer was not statistically significant with a relative risk of 0.96 and a confidence interval from 0.86 to 1.07. The effect in patients with small cell lung carcinoma was statistically significant with a relative risk of 0.86 and a confidence interval from 0.75 to 0.98. The overall effect, again, was not statistically significant with an I-square indicating some degree of heterogeneity of 35%. In particular, pre-planned subgroup analysis should lead review authors to present meta-analysis with the subgroups divided. There may be statistically significant differences in these subgroups. A test for interaction helps. In the example that has been provided here, and if a systematic review author intends to present the results for subgroups, they should consider creating a table for each subgroup. 
such as in this case, one table may provide the data for patients with small cell lung carcinoma, and one table may provide the data for patients with advanced cancer. If you do produce separate summary of findings tables, do not downgrade the quality of evidence for the indirectness. If you consider creating one table, such as is suggested by the lack of important subgroup differences in the example that we provided here, that is, there is no interaction and no important heterogeneity, or one may decide, based on a judgment that no important subgroup effect is present, one may present the effects for both subgroups together. Or one may present the effects for one subgroup only and indicate the effects for the second subgroup in a separate footnote. If there are important subgroup effects or the evidence is not direct enough to apply it to all patients at hand, then one would possibly downgrade the quality of evidence. The example that we provided here shows that judgment is required. There is no clear indicator that the effect truly differs in one group from another. However, the next example will provide perhaps clearer evidence for different effects in different populations or settings. This is an example is from a systematic review that looks at the effect of corticosteroids for acute bacterial meningitis. The investigators plan to evaluate the effects in high-income countries versus low-income countries. This example shows the outcome severe hearing loss in all patients. In low-income countries, the relative risk was 0.99 with wide confidence intervals. The test for the overall effect indicated no statistical significance. When the authors looked at the effect in high-income countries, they found that there was a fairly large statistically significant effect with a relative risk of 0.51 and tight confidence intervals. They found that there was important heterogeneity. Furthermore, they found that there was an important subgroup effect indicated by a test for subgroup differences and a p-value of 0.007. So under such circumstances, what should one present and how should the quality of evidence be rated? Once again, this is an example where review authors may create one table for each group, patients in high-income countries and patients in low-income countries. If they separate the tables, they would not downgrade the quality of the body of evidence for indirectness for each of these tables. When is evidence indirect for an intervention? A systematic review may ask, what are the effects of cryotherapy in women diagnosed with cervical precancer? Consider these three separate scenarios for the recurrence of cervical precancer. What if 7 out of 15 studies were conducted before 1985? New technology was introduced in cryotherapy in 1996. Does the evidence that includes a fairly large body of evidence from older studies directly answer the question? What if 8 out of 15 studies did not indicate if there were other core interventions such as prophylactic antibiotics provided? Is the evidence direct enough to provide an answer to the question without use of prophylactic antibiotics? And finally, in 5 out of 15 studies, cryotherapy was provided by nurses as opposed to other healthcare providers. Or the other studies did not indicate who was the actual provider of the intervention. Is the evidence direct enough to answer the question if all healthcare providers were nurses or if all were, for instance, physicians? Review authors must make judgments when they assess the evidence from the research studies in relation to the healthcare question that they might have asked in such settings. When is the evidence indirect for an outcome? Review authors should consider 
and choose outcomes that are important to patients or populations. They should avoid choosing surrogate outcomes despite the frequent use of surrogate outcomes and the frequent presentation of such data in the literature that they evaluate. Review authors should also present patient important outcomes in the summary of findings tables or indicate clearly what the surrogate outcome may stand for and assess the indirectness of the surrogate outcome to the patient or population important outcome that they were interested in. The following slide provides some examples of surrogate outcomes. For instance, investigators may feel confident that smear results in the sputum after two or three months of therapy may be good indicators of cure from TB. They may use cholesterol as a surrogate for cardiovascular outcome, outcomes, but must assess how direct such surrogate indicates cardiovascular disease and possibly downgrade the quality of evidence. If they are interested in health-related quality of life and respiratory disease and all they have is pulmonary function, then their confidence in the surrogate outcome may be importantly reduced and lead to downgrading the quality of evidence. If one is interested in all resource use and all that is available is the simple cost of individual drugs, downgrading may be required. HIV viral load as an outcome requires judgments about its association with morbidity in patients living with HIV. If systematic review authors are interested in evidence about venous thromboembolism and all they have is information about asymptomatic deep venous thrombosis, they must make judgments about the directness of such evidence. Similarly, blood levels of calcium phosphate may be very poor indicators of coronary artery disease. Coronary calcification measured by CT scanning will be only a surrogate for coronary artery disease and related events. Tumor size may or may not be judged an appropriate surrogate for survival. Similarly, public health interventions, a reduction in air pollution, may or may not relate to morbidity or respiratory disease. All of these surrogate outcomes require judgments about how they truly relate to patient important outcomes. Ideally, systematic review authors should focus on patient or population important outcomes. If only surrogate outcomes are available, then they must make judgments about the directness of the evidence and indicate clearly what surrogate outcomes have been used. An alternative option is to avoid surrogate outcomes altogether and provide information that patient or population important outcomes were not addressed. For guideline developers, they should clearly choose patient important outcomes. They may present results for patient important outcomes by applying the pooled effect size of the surrogate outcome to the baseline risk of a patient important outcomes. And under those circumstances, they should downgrade the quality of a body of evidence when they use a systematic review. When is the evidence indirect for comparisons? As indicated earlier, a systematic review may ask what is the effect of intervention A compared with intervention B. The available studies may compare intervention A at an inappropriate or very low dose of intervention B and therefore a systematic review author may downgrade the quality of evidence for indirectness. Alternatively, all the studies that are available are only addressing intervention A versus a control and intervention B versus a control. Review authors must make judgments about whether this evidence is direct enough to answer the question at hand. And when is indirectness serious or very serious? If there are very important differences in the populations, then there may be serious indirectness if it might be impossible to address how large the differences in the effects are, review authors may consider this very serious indirectness. If there are differences in the intervention or comparison, and these differences are sufficient to make a difference in the outcome, then there may be serious indirectness. A very weak association between a surrogate and a patient important outcome 
may lead to the judgment that there is very serious indirectness. The importance here is placed on providing the rationale for these judgments in the footnotes of summary of findings tables. So in summary, indirectness is evaluated using the PICO format and includes indirect comparisons. Tests for interaction can help making decisions about indirectness when it comes to the preparation of separate summary of findings tables. They should be pre-planned. Surrogate outcomes with uncertain relation to patient important outcomes should either not be used or would lead to downgrading the quality of a body of evidence when they are presented in summary of findings tables. For more information, please see Cochrane Handbook Chapter 12, the help section in the Great Profiler, also called Great Pro Software, or contact support at gradepro.org.